Shift Your Reptiles, the best customer service in the reptile shipping game. I've been using them for years. Their staff is extremely helpful. And just use shipyourreptiles.com. They're amazing. Hey everybody, it's Jeff. And today we're making a video about brumation. Why am I making this video? Well, over the years, um, I used to brumate in the standard method that everybody else was kind of brumating in. And the one thing I started noticing and it just doesn't apply to Western hognose snakes. This applies to like pretty much all colubrids that you're going to actually brumate uh, or want to brumate to uh, simulate that seasonal change so you can breed them in the springtime. And the, what I noticed was a lot of people were just brumating on regular aspen bedding, um, you know, dry substrates like that. And I was as well. And I would see people making videos where they'd pull their hognose or other colubrids out of brumation and offer them water. And these snakes would be chugging water and then some snakes would even get dehydrated in brumation because when they're brumating and they're really at really inactive temperatures their bodies are really slowed down and they're not going to be um you know apt to move around a lot and their digestive system is drastically slowed down so when they do drink sometimes they're actually not drinking to their uh fill and i've actually witnessed this where i gave some water and they drank and then i brought them out and warmed them up and then they were drinking excessively more and it actually makes sense because uh, where hognose are brumating in the wild, these abandoned rodent burrows, these hibernaculums is what they're called. Um, they re-excavate out old uh, rodent burrows and these prime spots for overwintering are is what known as their hibernaculums. And in these hibernaculums, the substrate is uh, very uh, moist and it's well-drained soil because they come from a region where there's loamy soil and loamy soil is well-drained, so it's not holding a lot of water, but deep down in these abandoned burrows, there is a level of humidity and moisture in the substrate down there. And as you can see, I have some hognose here, and these ones are actually sitting in cocoa coir. And they're not in very big in, you know, enclosures, and that's because these ones are, actually these ones just came out of brumation. I actually might put them back in after this video. And that's one thing you can do too while brumating, um, kind of jumping around here. But if you ever have to bring a snake out of brumation to warm it up, uh, just to offer water, that you definitely should do that. Uh, but going back to the dry substrate, I noticed that people were brumating on, you know, just like aspen, different types of aspen. And the snakes were always, you know, drying up or, you know, losing uh, moisture through respiration. And then they're just in an overall dry environment. And in the wild, that is not is what... It's not what's happening at all. Hognose, again, they're using abandoned rodent burrows as hibernaculums, and they're re-excavating out these abandoned burrows, and they're going down to a safe uh, level to get away from the elements, the cold temperatures, and they're burrowing down into that moist substrate. And that moist substrate is acting as like a cocoon, uh, keeping them from losing body moisture, and actually that moist substrate actually hydrates their scales and when they're very cold too, because it's like, you know, snakes will lose um, water through respiration. But when snakes are brumating, especially at appropriate temperatures or not so much appropriate, but more uh, standard brumation temperatures, their metabolism is slowed down so drastically that their respiratory uh, levels are significantly reduced. And you have animals there where their, their heart rates are really slow. Their overall, I should just say, their metabolism is drastically slowed down. And that's what brumation is. Because that leads into the other question, what is brumation? Brumation is the state of inactivity that reptiles and amphibians undergo um, it, to basically uh, overwinter or avoid adverse cold um, environmental conditions. So hognose snakes, you know, your picture of like bull snakes, gophers, uh, pine snakes, and these, especially the pines in the more northern colder climates, they're going to seek out hibernaculums. Uh, to get away from these inadequate temperatures. For one, they can't thermoregulate properly. They're not going to be able to uh, digest meals. Their metabolism's drastically slowing down, so they're going to be a little more inactive. And they, the, you know, they also have to avoid, uh, of course, dangerous temperature conditions, freezing temperature conditions. So they have to position themselves to ride this out. And brumation, again, that's what they call it for reptiles and amphibians. Hibernation is different. That applies to mammals. And with brumation, they're not completely like dormant. Their actually activities will be dependent on the temperature because some people brumate at warmer temperatures and you can. I've actually brumated in the low mid 60s with extremely good success. 
but the snakes are more active. And so then I definitely want to make sure that they have a water bowl if you're going to do a warmer brumation. All right, now for preparation for brumation, you want to make sure your snakes are completely empty because while an animal's brumating, their metabolism is drastically slowed down. They don't have the ability to thermoregulate and to digest properly. So my standard is uh, for a hognose snake and probably for a lot of other colubrids, I would do three weeks of no food. And two of those weeks, I'd be at like pretty much standard normal temperatures. Uh, the last week, you could turn down temperatures a little bit. And then the last few days, let's say three weeks and like three or four days, the last three or four days, I'm taking them completely off heat. I'm putting them in their hi uh, hibernaculum setups um, and then, then putting them into brumation. Hognose snakes, where they come from, the seasons can change very quickly. They have uh, extremely drastic temperature um, spikes and drops, especially when it comes around the fall time when these snakes are naturally preparing for brumation. Uh, so I've actually taken them right from like 75 degrees and put them, you know, right into brumation once they've been off food for like slightly over three weeks. And I'm doing a little different method too this year. You might be able to see behind me, I have some on coarse chips, still here, coarse uh, uh, Aspen Sandy chips. And then back here, they're all on cocoa coir. And some of these actually need more. I'm going to make it a little deeper. And I'm going to brumate them right in these rack systems because I actually have a brumation room. So I'm going to roll them, wheel them right into the brumation room, and I can control the temperature in that room uh, with my modified air conditioner. Uh, now, the only thing that I slightly worry about, and I think it's going to be 100% fine, is these have a little more ventilation than these containers that have minimal ventilation. And again, the minimal ventilation is actually going to be closer to replicating natural brumation versus like kind of like this, which isn't like a big deal. It's really just about the air circulation. And I'm just worried about them getting a little dried out. So what I can do in this case is offer them water. But a lot of times when they're really cold, they actually don't want to drink. So what I could actually do is I can wheel them out for a day, get them to warm up a little bit, and then offer them water. Is it okay to warm them up for like a day or two between, you know, or in the middle of brumation? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are some cool Minnesota studies I read about. Uh, I know Jeff LeClaire does uh, a lot of uh, research. He's uh, an awesome herpetologist, environmentalist. I don't know him personally, but I've read some of his research on Western hognose snakes. And anyway, they found that some were uh, come out, came out of brumation at the end of March, early April. And then once temperatures, uh, well, when temperatures got crummy again or a little cold, they actually went right back to their hibernaculums for a few more weeks. Uh, so it's again, it's like hognose snakes where they come from. Uh, the conditions are pretty volatile in the central plains. So doing stuff like that, warming up for a little bit, and then putting them back into brumation isn't going to interfere with their uh, cycle. The reason I brumate is to condition them for breeding. Because when you brumate them, that's the natural cycle that western hognose snakes and a lot of other colubrids are going through before um, springtime. And then once springtime occurs and temperatures become uh, adequate for them, they reemerge and their metabolism picks back up. And that's the instinctive uh, trigger for them to start wanting to develop egg follicles and then to consequently uh, breed and ovulate and then uh, deposit eggs or live birth, depending on the species you're talking about. And this is what I'm using right now for the, this particular snake. I have a 16 quart and six quart containers that I brumate in. And I brumate, uh, I've been talking a lot about uh, dry substrate, but that's the whole reason that led me to brumate like this is because in the wild, they're brumating in these uh, hibernaculums with well-drained soil and it's soft and loamy and it contains a lot of moisture. So I don't get the substrate sopping wet, but you want it to kind of almost like potting soil. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It could be a little on the little damper side than this and you know, even a little bit of drier side. And you can actually, if you do a larger container, you could do one side a little more wet, one side a little more dry. Although it's a hognose snake, so we know it's gonna till around and pretty much churn it up and blend it together anyway because they are still fairly active um, at cold temperatures. Now, if you get them down in the 40s, they become pretty inactive. And you'll actually see them want to naturally thermoregulate, especially the deeper the substrate you do. So if I do a container, like one of these 16 quarts, and I make the substrate like this deep, and they're brumating at like 50, 55, 58 degrees, let's say more from mid-50s, um, you'll see some that are buried. You'll see some that are more on top. But if you drop the temperature, let's say, down in the mid-40s, they'll all bury down. And that's a, just a natural, um, you know, response to cold temperatures because the way to evade these extremely cold temperatures is to go down into the ground where there's an insulator 
And if you go down deep enough, the temperatures, the cold temperatures aren't going to reach um, that, that area where they're going down to. And that's why these abandoned rodent burrows are so good in the wild because they already have these deep chambers and they use these probably a lot of times abandoned pocket gopher burrows, uh, maybe prairie dog. It really depends on the locale of the western hognose when it co comes to that. But again, other species are going to be going into, uh, let's say, milk snakes going to fissures and crevices and there's going to be moisture down there. And there might be some species that do find a little bit of water to drink. But the thing with western hognose are, when they're going down to these deep hibernacul hibernaculums, these abandoned rodent burrows, let's say in Montana or Minnesota, there can be three months at a time where there's temperatures that are not adequate or not even warm enough for them to emerge. And so that's why I came up with the idea. It's like, well, I keep seeing these hogos getting dried out and other species, and they need ample water to drink for a relatively short brumation period. While I know they're brumating for much longer in the wild. And there could be a couple factors. The one, well, the biggest factor is, is the substrate. When they're buried down in this moist, loamy substrate, again, it acts as like a cocoon. Um, it's going to actually keep their scales hydrated, so it's going to keep them from losing water that way. And the colder they are, the slower the respiratory is going to be, and they're not going to be losing hardly any more, uh, water levels through there. But if you brew made at warmer temps, they'll be respirating a little more, they'll be a little more active. And with this method, I've actually come to find that most actually will not drink, even if you offer them water. Now, this substrate, again, this one's like kind of like in an in-between. Um, this one is like is pretty okay, but I'd probably actually add a little bit of water to this one. And I still, the one thing I do suggest, though, is still offer them water. And you'll see, the, well, I'll jump to this, too, now. You see how this one just only has two air holes? Reptiles and amphibians use four to six times or four to six times less oxygen than mammals, rodents, and like birds on average. And that's with reptiles at their normal, um, you know, or their standard body temperatures when they're active and they're thermoregulating and processing meals and they're they're actually active. When they're brumating, those levels of the respiration is drastically lowered. I don't even know how much, but they're respirating very, very little. Um, look at frogs brumating. They will actually burrow down in the muck and leaves at the bottom of uh, ponds, and they don't actually, they're, they're completely covered up. Well, that's a, not the greatest comparison. It's not really a comparison. It's just an observation. But that's just showing, again, a lot of reptiles don't really need much. And you don't want a lot of airflow because you don't, it's not necessary. A couple air holes is more than enough. And the only thing you're going to do with a bunch of air holes is you're going to um, offer more just, um, you know, uh, air coming through and just more opportunities for the air to actually be lower in humidity and for the substrate to dry out. So some of my containers, I only have one or two air holes in them and that's it. Um, but I know how some people, you know, they, you know, you'll start to worry, well, I hope my snake isn't being suffocated. But again, that's not going to be the case. Uh, when these guys go and burrow into these hibernaculums in the wild, they're going down deep into them and they're backfilled. There's not, they can't have a fresh breeze of air especially when they're in Minnesota or Montana and it's negative 20 degrees out. They have to be hunkered down and they're in this moist uh, protective substrate um, and that's keeping them from losing um, water levels and they maintain hydration because during this period of brumation, it's all about conservation. So they're trying to conserve their uh, fat stores, which is very easy because they're so cold, their metabolism is drastically slowed down. And the most important thing is actually their water levels. If you bring a snake out of brumation and it's lost a lot of weight, that means it's dehydrated and it's losing uh, the water levels in its body. It's not really burning energy unless you uh, are brumating at some weird temperature like 70 some degrees or whatever, but that's not really a brumation then at that point. You know, brumation is on a spectrum. Um, you know, again, the hog goes in the mid high 50s can be fairly active, especially compared to one that's in the 40s. Do you need to brumate? In the 40s for hognose snakes, absolutely not. It's just, it's, a, it's not going to hurt them. Um, but mid 50s is my favorite temperature to brumate at because if you go down deep enough into the ground, let's say four or five feet down in the ground, um, during the summer, during the winter, it's always right around 55 degrees. So we know that's kind of the natural temperature, um, like target point for a lot of animals that go deep down into hibernaculums. And now I'm going to talk about um, different substrates you can use with this technique. This is coca coir. Uh, sometimes I do a coca coir sand mix. And the reason I like to do a sand mix sometimes, I just use like, you know, you could just use washed play sand. Um, 
the, the reason I like to use sand and a moist, uh, sorry, a mixture of coca coir, sand, and sometimes I use excavator clay is to actually mimic loam. Because where they come from in the central plains and these oak savannas, short and tall grass prairies, uh, the soil there is very loamy. And loam consists of sand, silt, clay, and topsoil. And their scales are specifically designed through evolution to live in that kind of environment. So replicating a similar substrate is just smart. Um, and I think it really works. And the, the, but the, the other thing is, too, it's not 100% necessary because I've roommated just on straight coca coir, and you get the same effect. Um, it really works. I think you use a lot of other bioactive substrates. Anybody that has, like, you know, um, you know, good bioactive products, a bioactive substrate from them, I think it would be fantastic. And, again, you could use this for, you know, your rat snakes, your uh, milk snakes, and kink snakes when you brumate, too. And I would still, again, offer water. I found a lot of times mine do not drink for even, like, I had one, actually, the longest I brumated um, with this method, and the snake didn't lose any weight. Uh, it was about five and a half months, and she took one little sip when it was all over, and she was offered water through the period, and I would actually take her water away if she didn't want to drink it. I'd place her a bite, place her in it, see if she'd drink, because anybody that keeps a lot of hog nose know, if your hog nose is thirsty and the snake is calm and you place it in the water and they're thirsty, they'll begin to drink. Um, but I still recommend offering them water just in case, because there is a bunch of factors. I don't know what temperatures you're going to be brumating at, Somebody could take parts of this information and not use all of it. And if you don't use all of it, you know, especially, say, if your ventilation's a little more or your air is just drier um, and your snake is sitting mostly on the top and your substrate isn't quite um, moist, I would go ahead and, you know, still offer water. And generally, like, none of mine with this method drink. Um, and it's like I've had questions, too, about RI or, you know, respiratory infections. I've never gotten an RI from doing this method. Um, again, this is, again, it's replicating how they naturally brumate in the, in the wild. Uh, and this is actually a more controlled environment. So it's very rare that I'm getting, every now and then you might get some, like, um, scales that get, like, a bit of scale rot, um, or what they call scale rot, where some of the scales get a little, um, inflamed. But once out of brumation, it quickly goes away, and the next shed cycle, it's been gone in those extremely rare instances. Actually, with all the ones I've been bringing out, I haven't observed anything like that at all. Uh, and the, the, well, the one thing, going back to the RI, you know, respiratory infections, that's actually caused by bacteria. That's why they treat them with antibiotics, because it's a bacterial infection. Uh, being in this moist, you know, environment that's natural isn't going to cause anything like that unless your snake is already predisposed to having uh, excessive bacteria buildup. Now I'm going to be showing you uh, some setup techniques. Here are them. These hog nose snakes are in six quart containers. And you can see this substrate is a little more moist. And that's probably a little closer to actually how I'd want it. And the coca coir, people ask me for the breakdown of my mixture. Uh, again, you can mix this with sand. You could do like a 5-10% sand. You don't need a lot because sand is extremely dense. Um, and you can do even, you know, use other bioactive substrates that I kind of previously mentioned. Uh, for the coca coir blocks, people ask like how much water you should be adding to your cocoa blocks. Um, and I get the big kilogram blocks because I use a lot. I use the 5 kilogram blocks, but you can actually use the mass and figure out for whatever size you're using and use uh, and just break, you know, just divide the numbers out. I get the five kilogram coca coir blocks and I use three and a half gallons of water per the five kilograms of coca coir. And then when it's mixed, it looks like that. And I let it soak for a while and then you can break it up, mix it up. And then if you want to add sand um, or any additional, um, you know, mix to it, you can. But you could just do straight coca coir. Coca coir is great. Um, I get, you know, it's pre washed. So there's no salt, like, or the salt levels in it are extremely, extremely low. Uh, I had somebody say, to ask me about that, um, salt, uh, salt levels, because coconut trees actually pick up a lot of salt through the roots, and they can actually contain a bunch of salt, but this is multi-washed, and that's not going to be the case with this coca coir. And you can see these snakes, you know, they get dirty, and it covers them nicely, and they burrow down into it. You can use bigger containers if you want. Again, they're very inactive, so they don't need a lot of space. And naturally, in the wild, they, uh, in these hibernaculums, uh, hognos brumate together a lot. So when hognos go to these hibernaculums, they are often in prime locations. So it makes sense that many hognos uh, go to the same exact hibernaculum and share it with other hognose snakes. 
Uh, so again, this is actually pretty natural to actually brumate hog nose together. You just want to make sure they're kind of cold when you put them together because you don't want any accidental feeding mistakes or you know one that's still kind of um, at typical temperatures or at temperatures where its uh, metabolism and appetite could still be there and you know might actually try to chew on or eat another hog nose. Well, I've never actually had that happen or any occurrence like that because when I bunk them up together like this, I make sure they're cold and the temperatures aren't adequate for digesting meals and their bodies naturally slow down and they're not going to want to eat when they're cold like that. And again, you can use 16 quart, 6 quart, you can even use larger. You, you can put hides in there if you want. Um, sometimes we'll use those, but usually I like to make the substrate a little deeper so they can bury down into it. 